Good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the Dunhuang Foundation. My name is Julia Grimes, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Foundation. Uh, we know many of you have navigated time zone issues and connectivity issues to join us this evening. And we'd like to express our deep gratitude for you doing so and for your continued support. It's my honor to introduce this evening's speakers, Mr. Vladi Kornatinu, Dr. Robert Duke, and Mr. Eric Hansen. Vladi Kornatinu studied for his MA in archaeology at Hebrew University in Jerusalem from 1974 to 1977. After graduation, for a brief time, he worked in Iran as a university lecturer and archaeologist. Eventually, his family settled in Los Angeles, where he honed his business skills and built a career in the apparel industry as president and CEO of Addiction. His extensive travels and business dealings in China led him to become a facilitator for US companies working in China, as well as representing the largest trade fair there, the Canton Fair in the US. Working in China for over 25 years allowed him to explore many archaeological sites, including his first visit in 2016 to the Buddhist caves at Mogao in the Gobi Desert. One cave in particular yielded an 8th century CE Hebrew scroll that highlighted the little known history of the Jewish presence on the Silk Road trade routes. He wanted to learn more about this merchant explorer, this Jewish Marco Polo, and to share his story. Dr. Robert R. Duke is an expert in Old Testament, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Second Temple Judaism. He spent almost four years studying in the Middle East, which has highly influenced his perspectives and teaching. Visions of Amram, his dissertation from UCLA on the Aramaic Qumran text was published as the social location of the visions of Amram in 2010. Duke has also devoted research time to improving pedagogy in biblical studies, investigating how service learning and community engaged teaching can improve student retention of course material. From 2009 to 12, he chaired the service learning and biblical studies workshop at the annual Society of Biblical Literature meeting. Among his many awards, he received a Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship to study at Hebrew University in 2000 to 2001, and he was a fellow at the Albright Institute for Archaeological Research in 2005. Our final speaker this evening will be Eric Hansen. He's CEO of Blue Planet VR, and he's a faculty member at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Eric is a visual effects designer who's worked with leading visual effects houses such as Digital Domain, Sony Imageworks, and Walt Disney Feature Animation. His film work can be seen in The Day After Tomorrow, Castaway, Fantasia 2000, and The Fifth Element, among others. Recent work has led to collaborations with Frontline, PBS, The Navajo Nation, and Ai Weiwei, the Smithsonian, and the Dunhuang Foundation. At USC, he leads curriculum in cinematic VR and visual effects. Eric is a member of the VES, IVRPA, PMA, and ACM SIGGRAPH, and attended the University of Texas at Austin. Our speaker's topic this evening will be Jewish merchants on the ancient Silk Road. Without further ado, Please join me now in welcoming them, beginning with Vladi Kornatinu. Vladi. Thank you, Julia. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the Dunhuang Foundation, Chris and Julia, for organizing this lecture and always supporting my Mogao Caves endeavors. My thanks also go to the Dunhuang Academy in China for accommodating my trips and research at the caves. My first trip to Dunhuang took place some six years ago while in Guangzhou organizing the Los Angeles Guangzhou Sister City um, Association's 35th anniversary and festival. A chance encounter while in Guangzhou and a lifelong friendship with one of the greatest Chinese composers and conductor, Tan Dun, opened a world unknown to me and I'll always be grateful. 
He was researching at the time his Budapest concert based on the stories depicted so stunningly on the walls of the Mogao caves. What started as just another trip to explore the beauty and history of China turned into a passion for the Mogao caves. On my first trip, while strolling through the museum galleries, I came across the Hebrew scroll. My eyes and heart skipped a blink and a beat. A Jewish traveler and the Hebrew scroll in that remote part of the world 1300 years ago. It was an incredible revelation. I became a member of the Dunhuang Foundation and traveled there several times after. My involvement with the foundation enabled me to explore the caves as no ordinary tourist could. I had the privilege to see as many caves as I wanted, caves close to the public due to preservation and explore the academy's library and vault open to the scientific world only. My biggest thrill was to work on translating the Hebrew scroll found at the site of the Southern Caves. It took me almost two years to find and collaborate with the right biblical scholar, Dr. Robert Duke, an American professor at Azusa Pacific University and fellow alumni of the Hebrew University Jerusalem. His knowledge and expertise in biblical text, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, made him the ideal person for its scholarly translation. With the translation completed, it was presented to the caves director by the foundation. During my last trip there in November of 2019, he assured me that the translation would be placed in the museum next to the copy. Originally it's in Paris, unfortunately. With COVID consuming the entire 2020, that project and the international conference where the scrolls translation was to be presented was shelved. I hope it will be revived in 2021. As Professor Duke will detail during his presentation, it is our belief that the Hebrew scroll written on paper that was only available in China at that time was written most likely by a Persian or Babylonian Jewish traveler from memory or dictated to a scribe. We do not know if it was left as a present to the Buddhist monks or simply was lost there. The most important part though is the knowledge of this Jewish traveler or as I call him, the Jewish Marco Polo that preceded the famous explorer by more than 400 years. With the Hebrew scroll project completed, the director gave me the unique opportunity to hold in my hands an original Syriac scroll found in the Northern Caves and then permission for Dr. Duke to translate that one as well. Syriac is another Semitic language like Hebrew used by early Christians in that part of the world. Dunhuang and subsequently the Mogao caves would not have existed without the famous Silk Road. Situated in the western reaches of the Heshi Corridor in China's Gansu province, Dunhuang has occupied a strategic position on the Silk Road for over 2000 years. It served as a vital passage between China and the rest of Eurasia and stands as the hub between North and South. Starting from Dunhuang travelers and traders who journey to the ancient capitals of Xi'an and Luoyang and to Central, Western and South Asia, all the way to the Roman Empire. To the South, travelers could reach Nepal, India and Burma. Because of this crucial geographic location, Dunhuang has occupied an important position in the interaction between Europe and Asia. Surrounding the Silk Road of Dunhuang are several spectacular clusters of caves excavated from the rock cliffs in the Gobi Desert. The largest is the Mogao site with about 735 individual caves comprising of about 45,000 square meters of wall paintings, more than 2,000 painted sculptures and some 50,000 artifacts from the library cave. The paintings, sculptures and artifacts bear record of five beliefs other than Buddhism, namely Confucianism, Taoist, Manishalism, Zoroastrian, and Nestorians from Persia and Central Asia. The caves founded by Buddhist monks beginning from the fourth century CE were the focus of worship for over a thousand years and were the repository of many other treasures, including works on silk and paper, as well as tens of thousands of Buddhist manuscripts and some foreign ones. The Silk Road promoted not only trade, but also the spread of religions like Judaism, 
Christianity, Zoroastrian, Buddhism, and later Islam. The earliest cave, according to records, was constructed by a traveling monk named Lezun in 336 CE. In 1900, the Buddhist monk Wang Yonglu discovered the library cave containing a huge treasure of more than 50,000 manuscripts dating from the 4th century CE to the 11th century CE. The manuscripts are written on paper, silk, wood, and other materials in many languages like Sanskrit, Tibetan, Uyghur, Cantonese, Mongolian, and even in Hebrew, in addition, of course, to Chinese. Foreign architects like Aurel Stein of the Hebrew Scroll and others took many of those manuscripts, art, and wall murals to their home countries, thus robbing China of their national treasures. Only a small part of the library cave treasures are still in China. In the 11th century, the monks sealed the cave in order to hide these treasures from impending wars. It remained sealed, thankfully, for 900 years. The library cave number 17 is located on the north side of the corridor leading to cave 16. It has an area of about 7.8 square meters and originally was built in between 851 and 867 AD in the, during the Tang Dynasty as a memorial chapel dedicated to an eminent monk. The role of the Jewish merchants on the Silk Road. China's forced contact with the Jewish people came as a result of the development of the Silk Road, the ancient trade route linking China with the Middle East and Europe that was created during the Han Dynasty in 206 BCE and incorporated existing trade routes that were established 200 years earlier by the Persian Ashurmanid Empire. The first large wave of Jewish merchants to China traveled from West Asia over the Silk Road and by sea via India during the Tang Dynasty, 618 to 907 CE. They consisted of Babylonian and Persian Jews who traveled along the Silk Road and received the Tang Emperor's blessing to ultimately reside in Kaifeng. A massive synagogue built in 1161 CE, accommodating a population of over 3,000 people is a testament to the vibrant Jewish community there. Undoubtedly, the Jews had important contributions to the Silk Road business activities as indicated by a number of sources. Though many of these sources point to the Chinese as the key players on the Silk Road, carrying silk and other items from the East, selling or bartering their goods to the Asian middlemen who traded the merchandise to the Persians, Syrians, and Greek Jewish merchants, which in turn sold the goods throughout the Roman and later Byzantine Empire. Because of the lucrative profits from the silk trade, Persians and Arabs dominated the trade. However, there were many Jewish settlements on the Silk Road and they were active in the trade as well. While most of the Jews were weavers and dyers of cotton cloth and silk, on the other hand, the Jewish merchants known as Radonites regularly engaged in trade on the Silk Road. According to the Babylonian Talmud, the Jews started settling in cities along the Silk Road as early as the fourth century CE. The common Aramaic language encouraged their settlement and involvement in the international trade. After the fall of the Roman Empire, Jewish merchants played a leading role. A Persian writer in about 850 CE recorded the journeys of the Jewish traders, the Radonites, who linked the Frankish and Chinese kingdoms by land and sea. There is clear evidence of Jewish communities at many of the overland posting stations as far as Khorasan, present-day Iran, the gateway to China. That Jews joined those going further is attested by the Judeo-Persian fragment found in Dan Dan Yulik and by the page of the Hebrew prayers found in Dun Huang, both from about 9th century CE. It is worth pointing that at the time of Christian Muslim animosity, when many trade routes were blocked, Jews were the best equipped to carry out the trade from Asia to Europe. 
the Jewish participation in the Silk Road was not only in terms of business transactions. They had also served as bankers and religious mediators. The bankers held money or deposit for merchants and in turn established sufficient credit. Due perhaps to the growing trade on the Silk Road, there was a need for the establishment of a credit system. The Jews were seen as the most qualified to handle credit transactions and act as commercial mediators for the simple reason that they are free of any religious prohibition against usury. It is therefore clear that the Jews had played an active role in the Silk Road as merchants, as weavers, and also as bankers. They became the most dominant merchants and group of people dwelling in that area during the period. The famous Venetian traveler Marco Polo, who visited China then under the Yuan dynasty in the late 13th century, described the prominence of the Jewish traders in Beijing. Conclusion. The Silk Road may be identified with Chinese merchants dealing with silk. However, it cannot be denied that the Jewish settlements in these areas had also their own shares in the business transactions occurring in this region alongside Arabs and other dwellers. The Silk Road, however, will continue to remain a legacy of the Chinese people. My quest is to continue on the ground exploration of the Magao and of the Jewish Silk Road. Anyone interested in joining us on that road of discovery is welcome to join. With the help of the Dunquan Foundation, these fascinating caves will be showcased to the world via the VR project. The foundation and Professor Eric Hansen, the VR developer, are in the planning stages of adding some 25 caves to the ones already on the platform. My gratitude to Eric for his amazing VR work and patience in teaching me the intricacies of the Oculus 2 VR and ways to explore the five caves already captured. I would encourage anyone to purchase the Oculus 2 and experience the caves like never before. As you'll see from his presentation, the VR is simply not only for tourist purposes, but proper scientific research. The capability to showcase in great details the existing art coupled with the ability to virtually bring back into the caves all those treasures scattered around the world would be an unprecedented achievement. The public at large, as well as the scientific world can greatly benefit from such a far reaching project and the Dunhuang Foundation will be at the forefront of our endeavor. Of course, my gratitude to Professor Duke for taking on the challenging work in deciphering the Hebrew scroll and subsequently the Syriac scroll, working with me in piecing together the history of the Jewish and Christian merchants on the Silk Road. Professor Duke spent the past two years researching not only the Mogao, Hebrew and Syriac scrolls, but expanded his research to other scrolls from China that ended up in US or other European museums. With the help of the foundation, we'll expand the research as many more scrolls are scattered in museums around the world. It is my sincere hope that I was able to give you a glimpse into the grandeur of the Mogao Caves and of the Jewish Hill Road, and that many of you will join the Dunhuang Foundation and help preserve this cultural treasure of China. As a member of the foundation, you'll have among other benefits, the privilege to travel to the caves on organized tours, exclusive to members only, a trip, an opportunity of a lifetime. This is an aerial view of the unforgiving terrain of the travelers on the Silk Road. Can imagine 2000 years ago, how difficult it was to travel from Dunhuang to Dunhuang and from Dunhuang further. This is a detailed map that anyone can study later on of the Silk Road. Uh, as we can see, goes from Constantinople, or from Jerusalem, via Persia, uh, all the way to Dunhuang. This is another pictorial map of the same, of the same region. Uh, this is, uh, these are the uh, Northern Caves uh, where the Syriac scroll was found versus the Hebrew scroll that was found in the Southern Caves. This is cave 1617, as it looked in uh, 1900. 
And this is cave 1617 as it looks today. This is one of the expl early explorer in 1908 period uh, with a stack of scrolls as they were there then. Uh, this is another picture from 1907. Looks a little bit more organized. Uh, this is a, uh, an example of looted murals uh, from the caves. As you can see in this picture, this portion was removed by London Warner uh, and taken to um, Harvard University because he couldn't find any more scrolls. Therefore, he had to take artwork. Uh, and this piece is obviously missing till today. Uh, this is a rendering um, of how it should have looked. And this is uh, in the museum. Um, and this is a prime example of what the VR can bring in the future, at least virtually, uh, this piece of art and many, many others to be placed back where it belonged. Uh, this is a rendering of the Jewish synagogue built in Kaifeng in 1161 from a manuscript uh, from the 17th century. Uh, this is a sculpture of a, a small, of a, it's, it's a, small uh, sculpture of a Jewish merchant uh, from 9th century CE in the Lyon Museum. This is another sculpture of a Jewish confectionery, uh, also from, from the 7th century, uh, residing at also at the Lyon Museum. Uh, Dr. Zhao, the Mogao Caves director that graciously uh, gifted me with the latest book on the Mogao caves and gave me permission to, to explore the caves. Um, in the Dunhuan library with a copy of the Jewish scroll. In the, here I am in the Dunhuang vault with the original Syriac scroll that I was so privileged to, uh, to be able to hold in my hands. Uh, these are the sand dunes that sit atop the Mogao caves. And this is the Sand Dunes project that uh, the Dunhuang Foundation uh, Academy with the, with the Getty Center are, are, are building those uh, small pits in order to trap the, uh, the sand from blowing into the, into the caves. And by building thousands and thousands of them, uh, they, they achieve uh, the goal to, to a great extent. Thank you for your attention, and please allow me to introduce now Professor Robert Duke. Good evening, and thank you, Vladi, for that introduction. Uh, here we are in California where I'm at, so good afternoon or good evening or good morning, wherever you might be uh, logging in. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and present from the uh, kind of language side the scrolls that uh, Vladi talked about. So let me get my screen set. So when I think of the uh, Mugao Caves, I realize that uh, very few researchers like myself uh, start off thinking about doing research in that area, particularly on the Syriac and Hebrew texts. So for me, where I began my journey is at the uh, caves in another part of the world, the caves of Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Here is cave four, which was the uh, Motherlode Cave at Qumran, where most of the uh, documents from uh, the site of that, uh, that part of the uh, world came from that we know of as the Dead Sea Scrolls today. Uh, over the uh, years, I've become very interested in another uh, location where many texts were found in the late 1800s, a place called the Cairo Geniza. Geniza is a word of uh, kind of a storage room for scrolls that are no longer uh, usable. And uh, here is a picture of Solomon Schechter, who was one of the scholars that worked on uh, these texts at Cambridge University. So several years ago when I first met Vladi and he was telling me all about the Mogao Caves and I started researching and looking at people like Paul Pelio and the work that they did um, uh, and the uh, various items that were coming out of it, it became very fascinating to me, particularly to start asking the questions of the similarities between these texts we have at Mogao, uh, other texts we know of along the Silk Road what about items from um, the Middle East or even from North Africa, like in, uh, in Egypt? So I started this journey. And recently, I've been 
even made more aware of the fact that uh, this trade from China coming west and then people from Europe going east, um, it is still an area that we are exploring. So recently on smithsonianmagazine.com, uh, uh, they talked about a discovery in England where they found Chinese coins from the 11th century that were found and showed that uh, these coins showed up much earlier in that part of Europe in uh, the UK than was uh, expected. So for me, before I ever heard about the Mogao Caves, I had actually heard about the material at Kaifeng, China. So on this map here, you can see the Silk Road from the west to the east and the blue, uh, the blue triangle that you can see on the map is where uh, roughly where Kaifeng, China is located. And it is at this place where there were many, many uh, 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 Jewish residents who were at that synagogue that Vladi mentioned earlier. So I'm gonna show you a couple pictures of the documents that were from Kaifeng, China. Uh, there is uh, still discussion on the dating of these, but uh, most likely uh, the 17th century is from when these come from 17th century CE. Uh, this text here is actually a copy from the book of Exodus. So right here at the top of the, uh, the text, we have a section from Exodus chapter 10, reading from right to left. So it is just a Torah portion text as uh, the Jewish reading tradition of the Torah. But also at Kaifeng, other items were found like a Haggadah. Uh, we're gonna be coming up on Passover soon. So a Passover Haggadah was discovered, most likely also from the 17th century. And on this, we have uh, some of the blessings that are said at Passover, like uh, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pri Hagafen, uh, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brought forth the fruit of the vine. So if you've ever taken part in a Passover Seder, uh, you will know that that uh, blessing and drinking of the cup happens numerous times. I point this text out specifically because I want to connect it to a uh, text later on. So as you see here on this slide, we have two circles that I put here just uh, to help focus the attention. But this is what is called the Tetragrammaton or the four letter name for God in the Bible. Usually it is four Hebrew letters. Uh, that are not looking identical, but there were workarounds where they would often put uh, the same letter Yod right here written three times as a placeholder. And this shows up in this Passover Haggadah from the 17th century in Kaifeng, China. Uh, another text that's just interesting to see is this uh, uh, inclusion of both Hebrew and Chinese characters on the same document. And this is basically a memorial book. It has a list of names. So here we have the name Abraham, uh, down here farther we have the name Moses and others, but you have this written right there with Hebrew and Chinese characters intermixed on the same document. So when I learned about the material at Dunhuang, which is here in the map, uh, it really made me interested in this whole question of uh, Jewish merchants and just uh, travel and text along the Silk Road. Uh, it is amazing how much material has come out of these texts. So even the picture that uh, Vladi showed earlier, just the hundreds and hundreds of scrolls stacked up, mostly Buddhist material uh, in Chinese, but you do have scores of languages. And if you go onto the International Dunhuang Project website that's hosted at the British Library, uh, you will just see in their search engine just the dozens of languages of material that comes out of this site, which is fascinating for me because I historically have been in Qumran studies, Dead Sea Scrolls, and the languages in the Dead Sea Scrolls are basically just Hebrew and Aramaic. Whereas when you look at the caves here at Dunhuang, it really shows you this cosmopolitan, a really pluralistic society of working with uh, literature from uh, dozens and dozens of people groups and religious groups. But here in this uh, uh, seminal volume, uh, 18 lectures on Dunhuang, there is so much material that this book of several hundred pages uh, does not mention the Hebrew, the Syriac material at all, just because there's not enough room to deal with that. So turning our attention to the Hebrew text uh, that Vladi mentioned, uh, you can see that this document has uh, 18 lines of text. We can also tell it was folded. I'm going to conclude later on doing a comparison of this text with the Syriac document to answer the question of even how a text like this would be used compared to other material. So this, unlike, say, scrolls that were rolled up or uh, were preserved in a um, uh, kind of a much more um, liturgical way or used in kind of liturgy, this one looks like it was probably folded and may have been kept 
say in a pocket or in a um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, baggage or something, but was not as what we would think of as scrolls. Now I mentioned the International Dunhuang Project. I'm assuming most uh, here have uh, some familiarity, but if you want to uh, look at more of the scrolls, more of the text and the items, you can search it. It has a very, very uh, active search engine that you can use. And uh, just to show you here, this is that Hebrew text. But uh, the International Dunhuang Project is one where it is spread out over many institutions, although it's housed at the British Library. But there's still a lot of work to be done. So uh, anyone on this uh, meeting who has language abilities in Hebrew, Syriac, in uh, Uyghur, in Sogdian, many different languages, you can participate and actually uh, suggest translations and bibliography that could be part of this. Now, the, uh, you can see here that there are some images missing. Uh, this one yet, this is the Hebrew text, doesn't have a translation yet. So it's something that uh, uh, hopefully we can start helping uh, improve even the International Dunhuang Project website uh, as we all work together. Now this text, this Hebrew text, is a good place to mention different voc uh, vocalization systems. Uh, for any of you that are familiar with Hebrew text, you're familiar with the vowel points that are underneath letters. Uh, Hebrew and Aramaic is a consonantal language where it's consonants that are written and the vowels are provided by dots above and below letters. And the Tiberian system is mostly below the letters. But there was a Babylonian system, which this text has, which uh, even uh, as Vladi was mentioned, this uh, group of Babylon Babylonian Jewry where you have the kind of beginnings of the Silk Road. Uh, it's interesting that this uh, one Hebrew text that has been discovered does preserve this Babylonian uh, vocalization system. So let me focus in though and show a couple pieces of this text just to, just to uh, start explaining a little bit more of how a text like this was used. So here we have in uh, the yellow highlight on the text, a section from the biblical text of Micah, the biblical book of Micah, chapter seven, verses 18. Miel Kamocha Nase Avon, who is a God like you who uh, kind of removes sin? But you can see if you are looking at this that what should have been two words is written as one word. Uh, as Vladi mentioned, this text was most likely either copied down by a scribe who didn't know Hebrew and was hearing it but knew how to write the letters or was uh, more for a personal use. So therefore did not uh, have the same uh, rigors of uh, kind of scribal. Um, uh, activity. So it has more variance uh, in it than uh, one would see in a normal uh, Torah scroll. Another uh, passage from Psalm 69, uh, you can see that there are uh, similar uh, letters, but there are areas where it makes sense that there's an extra uh, yod here uh, in other places. But I put this one here because I wanted you to notice the three yods right here. The second word above in the clearly written Hebrew characters is the name for God as it is usually shown in Hebrew scrolls and Hebrew texts. But in this text, we have the three yods that are being used rather than writing out the full name. Uh, there's many different uh, discussions on why that is, but these little pieces of trying to find out where this system of using three yods also shows up in other documents is something to consider. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, in a text that goes back to the 1930s, you had a professor, uh, Lauterbach at Hebrew Union College, who wrote an entire uh, article on the substitutes for the Tetragrammaton. So what are all the different ways people did not write out God's name, but use substitutes by using either other letters or other forms? So just to give you a sampling, here is just four different entries of three different yodes and how it was and where you can go find those documents. This number 46 here is one where I think it has the closest comparison to what we have in the Mogao caves. And we have this showing up in the Cairo Geniza. I showed the picture earlier of the Cairo Geniza, which is on a, in a very different part of the world than what we're talking about here with the Silk Road. But just to show you a couple items from the Cairo Geniza. It's housed at Cambridge University. Uh, the TS stands for Taylor Schechter, which was the, uh, the way the uh, Cambridge library system uh, represents these texts. So these were found in, Cam uh, in Cairo, Egypt, were taken to Cambridge in the uh, early 1900s. And here's an example of the three yodes that are being used in 
place of writing out the full name of the Lord. Another one, which is a commentary on the book of Joel, also has the three yodes with a line over the top that looks very similar to the Kai Feng document I showed earlier. Just to uh, expand it a little more to look at the other types of literature that needs to be consulted, and this is an ongoing project, but there's also in the area of modern day Iraq, uh, things that we call incantation bowls or magic bowls that were written in Hebrew, Aramaic, Mandaic, and other languages. And just to give you an example, this blue line that I have here on my slide is uh, the Shema, the hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But uh, these magic bowls were written in a uh, kind of a protective way that you would have various uh, 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 Bible verses or others that were interspersed. So on this one, the Shema is quoted, but it is interspersed with passages from other parts of scripture. So the red here is the Shema, whereas this is Psalm 91. So it is an alternating form. So an area of research that I'm gonna to continue to pursue is look at all the various magic bowls uh, here at Exeter University in England. They have a whole archive of uh, magic bowls of looking at are there similarities in any of the biblical passages or in say the way the name of God was written on any of these magic bowls. Turning our attention back to the Hebrew text, on the right is a full transcription of the, the text. Um, uh, I recently had a very wonderful conversation with Professor Aaron Kohler at Yeshiva University, and uh, we're actually in the process of making some suggestions to each other of even improving the reading, and it would help very much if we had uh, even some modern photography, very high resolution photography, that we could help fill in the tops and bottom lines that you can see over the centuries uh, have basically disappeared. To give you a sense of what's on this text, in parentheses are all the different biblical passages that are quoted. So Micah 7, 8, Numbers 14, 9, Psalm 66, and so on. So this whole text is basically one biblical quote after another and was most likely, as I said, kept uh, on the person, who, whoever was uh, carrying this along the Silk Road. So turning our attention to the other text that Vladi mentioned, the Syriac text, here is one side of the document. As opposed to the Hebrew one that was only written on one side and folded, this is actually a two-sided document, and it would have been put together with other two-sided documents, sewn together, and then folded and actually read like a book. In the cave where this material was found, a lot of other items were found. There was a 5th century uh, CE Persian coin and then a Syriac cross. So there's a lot of material that still needs to be kind of uh, uh, understood in light of all this. Now, the Syriac text has had its uh, initial publication in a German publication uh, in 2001 by Duan King. And uh, it also uh, shows up in a book that I'm still trying to get my hands on that was published by the Dunhuang Academy, and it is out of print. But uh, it, there is a transcription of the text and then some basic discussion. But some of the specifics that I find interesting, and I think there are some things still to explore, is how this text was used. So this is side A. There's two sides, as I said. The top right is a few verses from Psalm chapter 25. The bottom right and going on to, in the bottom right is a quote, or is quotes uh, from Psalm 28, one to five. The top left is Psalm 15, and the bottom left is Psalm 17. Now the red writing that you can see here uh, is two different things. So let me actually show you the next one and then I'll explain what the red writing is all about. The top right of the backside is Psalm 21. The bottom right is Psalm 23, the first four and a half verses. And then the end of Psalm 23 is on the uh, side B. And then you have Psalm 24. And then at the very bottom, Psalm 25. So we have a liturgical text here that was used in some kind of reading, Eastern uh, Syriac reading tradition. And the red that is on here is actually naming the days of the week. So for example, the one on the bottom right here uh, is actually naming Wednesday. So it actually says Monday, this text has four, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So we have the different uh, kind of Psalms readings for that day. The other uh, writing that is repeated on both sides is then actually it says, and its companion. So you read one section and then you'll read another one say in the evening or another time during the day. 
So let me focus in to the text, starting with uh, the one side on the, uh, or the back side. So what I wanna do for this is just do side B, and I'm only gonna focus on the Psalm 23. Knowing we didn't have time to go through the entire text tonight, and since many might already be familiar with Psalm chapter 23 uh, in the biblical text, I thought it might uh, be helpful to uh, kind of zoom in and show you what we have here. So on the right is the text on the uh, Syriac document found in uh, cave B53. And then on the left here is a transcription of that material. Now, something that is very common in the uh, Peshitta, which is the name of the Syriac uh, uh, Bible, uh, is to have superscripts. So at the beginning of each psalm, there would be a superscript that was given. So if you open up a, a standard uh, Syriac Bible, there will be a long superscript before you get to the actual first verse of the text. So for anyone familiar with Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is the word Lord at the top right next to the red writing. And down here, this is where the word the Lord shows up in the printed uh, modern examples of the Syriac text. So this, all this material that is the superscript uh, does not show up on these documents. The translation then is the Lord is my shepherd and nothing. It actually cuts off. There's actually another word that should be here, but this text must have been so familiar that they could just write the first text and they knew that the reader would fill in the rest. Same thing with the fourth line. Uh, he restores my soul, he leads me in the right, but it cuts off what should have been remaining there without going to the next line. Going to the top left of that side B, we just had one more line from Psalm 23, 4B. Uh, your rod and your staff, they comfort me, and then it ends. So there's actually one more verse uh, in the uh, Hebrew Bible that has this text uh, that is in Psalm 23. So we have here a text that is almost pristine when it comes to the copying, as opposed to the Hebrew text that I mentioned, where it seems like it was uh, used for very personal reasons. It was something that maybe was copied by someone hearing it and then writing it down without actually seeing it. There are some very stark differences between these two texts. So one interesting item comparing these two is that you have Psalm 25 actually on both of them. On the Syriac document, there's a part of Psalm 25, and there is a quote from Psalm 25 in the, uh, on the Hebrew document. Now, this Hebrew one was for personal use because it uh, did not have the kind of official feel of being an official, uh, say, text that was written. On the other hand, the Syriac text was used for very liturgical reasons, even had the days of the week spelled out, where it would say on which day you're reading which psalm. The Hebrew document has many scribal variants when compared to official documents, whereas the Syriac has very, very few scribal variants. And uh, you could pick up a uh, Syriac text today that was written in modern times, compare it with this from uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and there's almost no variants, and they are uh, almost identical. So when you think of these two texts coming from very different religious backgrounds with very different purposes for why they were written and why they were carried on the Silk Road, uh, it really gives an interesting uh, kind of dynamic that shows you the exciting reality of Dun Huang research. We just focused on two documents tonight when we're looking at Hebrew and Syriac. When you open up the door to all the other languages that are in these documents, you start realizing how immense this collection is. And one thing I didn't mention, and I'll go back just real quick so that you can see it, but on the Syriac document, on the left-hand side, you can actually see some writing in the middle here. That's actually the Uyghur language. It is uh, not Syriac. It is a completely different language, and it has no connection to the text there. So this document must have then been used secondarily or someone was writing, say, notes in the margin to, uh, to note various things. So that's a whole nother research project of which I don't know we are. So you need this collaborative ex work together. As I think about tonight's presentation too, we have uh, an archeologist and business person 
who is connected to someone who does Dead Sea Scrolls research, who is connected to someone who does technology with virtual reality. And it really seems to me to be a fitting kind of metaphor for even the world there along the Silk Road. You had scholars, you had people who were interested in technology, you had people of the business community all traveling the same road. And the documents that they have left us show that to be true. So we're gonna now turn our attention with uh, Eric's presentation, looking at uh, the way virtual reality and VR technology uh, can help when we are able to look at the text and even starting to give creative ideas on how we can all start uh, reimagining even digital humanities and how we can help students use modern technology to even understand and explore their world even more. So Eric. Thank you much, Robert. Let me go ahead and share screen here. Well, great. Well, thanks so much for including me in this talk today. Um, I make no pretense to be an archaeologist, uh, but I love uh, working with them and exploring the world of archaeology. It's been kind of my passion for many years. Um, I'm a computer graphics expert. I worked in uh, visual effects and feature film for 20 plus years and was a big believer in that until I realized the films I was working on were getting worse by the year and not better. And, but I've always had a, a very rich uh, set of, of uh, interests and passions outside of film uh, in cultural heritage and the outdoor world. So I decided to uh, about uh, probably 14 years ago, start a company to uh, take all the skills <clears throat> that I had acquired in features and apply them towards the, the real world. So I kind of moved from fiction towards reality as I often say. Um, and in doing so, uh, because my background is in environments, I was originally an architect, um, I uh, became very impassioned with virtual reality as it kind of came back in and uh, became democratized in the field and accessible for the public. Um, so in any case, we uh, started off, actually our very first VR project, I worked with uh, a collaborator, Greg Downing, in a company called X-Res Studio for Extreme Resolution. And um, we actually took a, an Egyptian tomb that Greg had shot uh, while on site with Nat Geo uh, many years ago. And it was a pivotal moment in my life when I put that headset on. And this is a type of virtual reality, which again is becoming mainstream, but was a bit rarefied. And that is to be able to have a spatial world that you can interact in and walk about and truly feel present. Uh, earlier three uh, uh, VR, was considered 360 filmmaking, <clears throat> where you could look in any direction, but you really didn't feel present in the world. So, um, and the other thing I'll say about uh, my particular career is I've been just uh, kind of blessed to have increasingly amazing opportunities come my way, uh, the older I get. And this has uh, been one of the highlights of my career, uh, thanks to Christian, Julie, and Mimi was to, uh, to help them and capture uh, these remarkable caves. And uh, it is an ongoing project. We've done a significant amount of initial work and there's just as uh, Vladi, I think it indicated, there's just so much that can be done. So what I'm gonna do here, just to keep this presentation moving along, is I'll show you just a very small background into how we do the work. And then I'm actually gonna don a VR headset. So I'll kind of step back away from my camera and I'll just take you through a few of the caves that have been captured. Now, this is a poor substitute for actually having a VR headset on. When you have one of these headsets, you feel dimension, you feel, again, presence, you can feel the atmosphere, uh, and you have the freedom to walk about. So I'm gonna be doing that with this little laser beam uh, technique. I'm not sure how many of you have experienced this, but in any case, I wanna give you a taste of it so you can see the nature of the work that we're doing. And we're doing this project uh, specifically to, uh, to bring these caves to the public and to foundation members and uh, really just to try to proliferate the experience, the remarkable experience of being able to experience these caves, which are accessible, but quite a, quite a uh, plane ride from uh, the United States in any case. So uh, what I'll, let me go ahead and uh, advance now and let's see. So the technique, I'm not gonna go technical at all. I'm gonna go very rapid through this, but um, this is one of the caves, cave number three. And this was shot with a particular rig that I designed with three cameras, DSLR high resolution cameras. And this is kind of uh, compacted, but it extends out. 
and we get a camera pointing down at the ground. We get one pointing up at the ceiling artwork and we get one uh, horizontally. And then basically, and luckily we had really nice grid laid out in most of the caves of one foot squares. So I could uh, kind of calibrate and, and walk my way around taking these hundreds or thousands of shots. Um, another technique we'll use is with a handheld pole. And here you can see a time lapse of using a ring flash. And what this allows us to do is get even higher resolution, gigapixel resolution, with a very flat light. Um, so we shoot these both with natural light and also with kind of uh, a de-lit uh, sense of lighting, very flat. And this could be used more for research or archival uh, purposes. Um, okay, let's go on to the next. So what we end up with this, and there's a, this is now in the world of computing, we end up recreating the points of where those cameras were, but we also recreate the intersections of the common points. And these become what are called a point cloud. And uh, so now you can see kind of a ghosting of what uh, this particular cave appears to be. The next step is to take it and to create a solid surface um, that kind of drapes onto that point cloud. And uh, so this would be a, what we call a polygonal mesh. And now you can begin to see detail within, but it really all comes together when we take all the pixels of the photography and we, when we project that as a unified projection of all those thousands of images uh, aggregated into the surface that, that uh, is draped over this polygonal mesh. Well, of course, this is now a three-dimensional model and with extremely high resolution. Um, this is just a sample view approaching this model. And this, in fact, is not even our finished model. This is just an initial uh, kind of look at what we had shot there. Um, what I'm going to show you in a few minutes is actually uh, more final, where we can do extreme uh, resolution uh, inspection of the caves. But uh, again, to be able to stand here in these caves virtually and feel remarkably present is just one of the most magical things I've ever experienced working with technology. And I have clearly, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> certainly dedicated the rest of my career and lifetime to exploring this. It's just a remarkable thing. Um, so anyway, now this is cave 16 and 17. I'm gonna come back to this uh, and talk about and conclude on that uh, to talk about what we're going uh, to do with these scrolls in the future. But for now, what I'm gonna do is, is put on a headset, as I said, this is a piece of software where we assemble this experience. And uh, hopefully you're not gonna see me standing back here looking rather silly, but I'm gonna stand back and I'm gonna launch this. I'm gonna try to speak uh, a little loudly so you can hear me. Uh, if uh, Julia or Christian, if you think you're not hearing me enough, let me know and I can switch microphones to the VR headset. This is one of the, the headsets that we use. Um, this is a very expensive unit. But um, we have now taken some of these caves into a very affordable headset called the Oculus Quest 2. And it's released now for $300 and it does everything this, we'll call this a $5,000 headset does. So it's a rather remarkable time for virtual reality as well. This year is a big breakout year for it. And with Vladi, we've taken a few of the caves over and, but uh, I'm gonna show you kind of the fuller experience here. So give me one moment to start this. And I've also muted the audio because we have a lot of narration uh, and a lot of uh, kind of informational UI that's been placed in. I've muted that so you can hear me speaking. Okay, so I'm gonna stand up now and stand back here a bit. All right, and let me see if I'm out of camera. Looks like I am, luckily. Okay, so I'm gonna speak a little more loudly. Uh, this is the base experience. It's a welcoming graphic. There, you can see we can experience this in uh, Mandarin. We can do a simple tour for those that don't uh, want to learn the dexterity. These are hand controllers that I'm holding. You can see a uh, kind of a laser pointer. They have different buttons. Sometimes it's a bit confusing. So we've made a simple tour, which is you're kind of led through. We also have an introduction that teaches you how to use these devices. But I'm just going to uh, cut straight over to the caves and I'll highlight that and now we'll load up uh, the exterior of the McGow Caves. Now this is in fact, um, I believe only probably 30%, probably 40% of the length of the cave. I could be wrong, 
but this is a, a very initial capture we did by taking a few uh, thousand photographs walking the length of it. As I shift my body weight, we can see, maybe hopefully you can feel the dimensionality of this model, but it's been scaled down to feel like kind of a museum installation. It actually, in my perception, it feels about three feet tall and probably about 30 feet wide. So it's a miniaturization uh, effect that we can do. But what I'm gonna do now is take the laser pointer and these are the five caves, uh, I'm sorry, four caves that we have here in the main array. And I'm gonna take you into cave 275. Now, this one we started out by giving you, I don't know how well you can see this, it's very dark, but I'm holding one of my hand controllers has actually become a flashlight, so a light source. So we, we added this as a feature just to kind of give you some sense of looking into the, uh, the mystery of a cave before uh, uh, they were discovered. Now, this array of informational graphics you see are actually narrated passages that um, if I land into, so here, let's see, let me, I have a little arc, hopefully you can see this. And if I land into uh, one of these, actually, I'm gonna take us into daylight now. So that'll highlight, and as I remove it, it becomes daylight. This is the daylight version we shot of this cave. Um, here's my hand controllers. And I can always, I can also do things, whoops, I got a little too quick here, but see, I can move up closely and inspect the sculpture. Hopefully you can see the dimensionality of it. I'm going to go back to Buddha construction. Let me actually, let me get out uh, a little bit farther here. This is a very small cave. And now we can see if I look up, this will cycle us through an animation of witnessing the construction. These were models that I scanned from the uh, museum on premises. It's not exactly the same, uh, but uh, likely the same construction technique. So that's another, and there's narration that goes with this. Now I'm going to exit this cave and take you to some grander ones. So let's exit. And let's see, hold on. All right, and we're back. And now let's take you into uh, cave 285. And so now I am resident in this cave and I have the ability to, as you can see, place this little puck so I can stand right here, say, and look at celestial canopy. As I look up, I can see naming now uh, of the asparas and other uh, elements depending on where I land. So let's take this puck, let's land in here. And this now shows the Indian uh, deities that are placed on either side. Now, what you're not hearing is all the educational narration that's been written by scholars that describe uh, all the, uh, a lot of the history of these uh, spaces. So let's uh, go ahead and leave this one now. We'll use this controller. One moment, bear with me. Get this one just right. There we are. And uh, now let's go to cave 428. And this was uh, quite quite a grand cave to capture. Uh, this was a took about two days to take thousands of images in this cave. Uh, fabulous sculptural form. And again, as I rock my body on my feet. I can feel the dimensionality. Um, I can walk around and let's go to the back of this central form. Actually, I think I'm circumambulating in the opposite direction. Probably shouldn't be doing that. But let's go back here and we get a little darker. So now if we land and change lighting, now we have our official light and we can see, uh, inspect the sculptures back here a little more. So these are all techniques that we built up that allow you to carefully inspect the cave. This one, in fact, will show the Tiger uh, uh, Jataka story, and you can see it highlights, and actually the narrator is reciting the story as we go. So, the, and we are just really beginning to explore the informational potential with this. Now here we see a uh, landing cylinder up higher, and as I hold my puck, there's kind of an invisible platform. I call this scaffolding. And now we can actually just kind of jump up to this high point and we can look at these uh, sculpted forms. 
And this is talking about the technique of these uh, icons. But again, we're seeing the cave now in a viewpoint that you really could never uh, do as a, as a uh, visitor to these caves uh, if, if you were not a researcher. So let's go back now and I'll take you into one final cave. And this is my favorite. This is 158. And let's land in here. And this, uh, I think, is 65, maybe 80 feet in width. Uh, just a tremendous uh, sculpture. I am not going to tell you about um, the history of this. I am just not uh, uh, qualified. But there is just a, a remarkable amount of artwork um, in this cave that I find just stunning. Now, one thing I can do is I can go up here to a high platform. And now I'm at the far end of the reclining Buddha. And I can see a very novel point of view here. So we can actually do things that you could not do on site. I can get a little bit closer to this artwork and see the remarkable emotion and uh, occurrences that took place. Actually, funny enough, in this Buddha, we found a bird nest uh, <laughs> on top of the head, which I don't believe anyone knew about. And uh, we got that from being able to reconstruct the model. And we looked at that very closely and went, wow, I don't, and we, we didn't know if it was a historic bird nest or current day. Um, but in any case, let's go back to the ground again. And let me show you a great research feature. So if I take my two controllers and I turn them upside down, I end up with two things. One is kind of a camera frustum, and, as I, and then another is like an iPad. And if I hold it out away from myself, it's small. If I bring it towards my face, it gets large. And now I can go in and start to observe artwork at a very close scale. And this was, uh, we took a lot of special care to capture this in the highest resolution possible. Uh, a cave like this is so rich with detail. Uh, this is just such a fabulous thing. Now, what the next step on this will be annotation and being able to save and capture views, being able to query uh, what sets of images contain, say, that particular figure. Uh, and uh, other applications we haven't even conceptualized yet. Um, this is wonderful to go up onto the ceiling and see some of the fabulous uh, detail that exists there. But again, a casual viewer would have no way to inspect uh, otherwise. Okay, great. Well, I think what I'm going to do now is uh, for sake of time, I'm just going to take off the headset. So uh, cave 16 and 17, and this is what uh, I've been working with Vladi on for a few days, and this is just, uh, just an impression of what we could do on a return visit. So these, these images are actually taken from a wonderful site, E-Dunhuang, who the uh, uh, Dunhuang Academy has put together, and it's a series of beautiful uh, panorama images of a uh, large, large uh, quantity of caves. So this is 16 and 17. So I just uh, did some capturing here to, to use this as the basis. So as we walk in to 16, uh, we can see uh, a larger chamber. If we turn to the right, we can see what was discovered. I'll let Robert or Vladi uh, talk about this, uh, the history of this. But this is one of the great discoveries uh, apparently made and uh, now revealed. So let's go ahead and enter that cave. And here's the opening. And as I understand, this is a more contemporary sculpture and pedestal. But the idea here was to try to uh, reconstruct or kind of visualize what this would have been looked like based on historic photography of the scrolls. So this is just a very simple modeling I did of, of uh, computer graphic scrolls kind of uh, contained in the space and matching the perspective. And then just kind of thinking if we had a hand controller in VR in the space, we could reach out and then uh, grab one of the scrolls and then we could unroll that and actually look at it. And this is the Hebrew scroll that Robert had just shown. Um, so, and this, of course, could lead to amazing uh, kind of virtual uh, visitation and virtual research. Um, just one simplistic idea, but again, the potential here is just extraordinary. And I think that, oh, and, and here, of course, we could also query with some of the hand controller functions, uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the different uh, translation. And some of the work that Robert's doing could be embodied in what you could uh, experience uh, directly here in the cave. 
Okay, so I think that's uh, what I had. Do you, uh, Julie, do you wanna come back in? Or I guess I have everybody come back in. Hey, we've all rejoined, I believe. Everyone, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, that was greatly illuminating. Um, we've had some questions coming in um, as the lecture has gone on. Some of them we've answered already. Uh, directly to the people sending them, but there are a few other questions that haven't been addressed yet. The first is, and I'm addressing this to the entire panel, so please feel free to chime in. Were Jewish merchants rare or plentiful on the Silk Road? Did Judaism affect Buddhism? Did Buddhism affect the merchants and Judaism? So they're wondering if there's any potential for cross-cultural um, influence that may have occurred in or around Dunhuang or on the Silk Roads in general? Let me jump in with some thoughts and then Vladi can share some. One of our challenges with Dunhuang is that we have this one Hebrew document. So in some ways we are trying to extrapolate by what we know from other parts of the Silk Road, either going west or going to Kaifeng farther east. Uh, Kaifeng though gives us a lot of information on the interaction between uh, Judaism and Confucianism and there were, uh, even talk of intermarriage and all of that, which uh, I've always found kind of really interesting to see that uh, uh, probably more um, harmonious uh, coexistence in Kaifeng and other parts of the Silk Road in times when you had parts of Europe and others where there was lots of tension between say Christianity, Judaism and Islam. Um, so I think one of the um, potential benefits of uh, really exploring deeply this uh, 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 Silk Road and the interaction in places like Dunhuang, where you have all these people groups coming together, is maybe giving us vision for even modern times of how we all need to work together even better. Well, I would guess because Dunhuang obviously was the, uh, the beginning of the Silk Road uh, in China, that uh, due to the trade became a very wealthy city. Um, therefore, if you're Jewish merchants or Christian merchants, or Chinese Buddhist merchants, uh, they all interacted over there. Um, obviously we don't know because we don't have, uh, you know, much documentation, uh, but going along the Silk Road, like you said, all the way to, to Kaifeng and Kaifeng holding a, uh, a substantial Jewish community of thousands of people, um, I am sure there was, was a tremendous interaction in between the Judaism and, and Buddhism, and they all learn from each other something. Excellent, thank you both. Um, it's true, we really have to um, postulate and come up with, a, with theories as to these, uh, the answers to these questions, because sometimes we don't have concrete evidence based on the textual record. Um, we have another question. Why do we think the prayer found at Dunhuang was necessarily carried there by a Jewish person? Could it not have been acquired and carried by a non-Jewish traveler who thought it might protect them? Well, until Robert uh, thinks about it, well, there was a, there was a, well, a couple of things. There was a uh, Persian coin that was found over there. Right. So that indicates that a Persian traveler was on that route. Then uh, we have the cross uh, that is associated with the, uh, with the Syriac scroll. So at the time, anyone else would not carry somebody that doesn't speak Hebrew has, you're talking about, you know, uh, uh, ninth century uh, to carry a document and leave it as a present to somebody else or, or just lose it there, it's unlikely. Therefore, I am, I'm, I'm quite convinced that, plus we know that there was a major trade route where Persians uh, or people from the Middle East were traveling that route. So the likelihood that one left, and gladly he left uh, such a document or lost the document over there, it's an indication that yes, a Jewish person was, was carrying it. Not, a, not just random uh, person. Right, picked it up or whatever. Yeah, in uh, more my background, Dead Sea Scrolls research, it's always that lacuna, the, the piece that doesn't show up on a document that gets the most interest. And here's one is 
we don't have, say, great documentation in Dun Huang of, um, uh, say, non non literary, more historical, or even just uh, uh, records of other kinds saying uh, uh, interaction between Judaism and these other groups. Um, but it does; it would surprise me to think that uh, someone would be taking this and just maybe carrying it like an amulet or some kind of protective uh, device. And I think for me, just the, the, the amazing list of passages, they really feel like they're very personal to the person. Um, I have looked at um, a genre of literature in Judaism called slichot, which are kind of confessions and, and, and so on. There's a lot of similarity between those, but I have yet to find any of the known slichot throughout uh, Jewish history where you have the same listing of passages. So it does seem quite kind of personal. And who else would have this personal uh, uh, bring together these various texts except someone who could read it and at least was uh, interested in them? Right. It doesn't seem like it's by chance that these particular passages on this document ended up in Dunhuang. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a question for Eric specifically. Um, there have been recent debates in Dunhuang studies about visibility in the caves and the lighting situation. So allowing students to have a sense of the lighting situation in the caves is very important, especially when most reproductions are shown as well-lit photographs. With the, will the VR system be able to simulate the more subdued daylight effect in the caves, like morning sunlight or afternoon sunlight, et cetera, maybe even lamp lighting? Thank you. Absolutely, Anne. Hello there. And uh, yeah, it's uh, what we, our objective for these caves, of course, for these initial visits was to, uh, to be able to view the artwork as clearly as possible. Um, what we used again, you saw a bit of the lighting that I described, but uh, even the daylight that was captured and most of what I showed you, what were the daylight versions, but they were shot with high dynamic range. So we're shooting a bracket of, uh, of exposures. And what that allows us to do is kind of pull up the luminance of the shadows, uh, allowing you to, to observe the artwork a little better. Um, a very, and we've talked about this, we could very easily have different lighting conditions placed on the hand controller where you could say, give me possibly a more, you know, representational image for the, the you know, maybe a darker kind of dramatic uh, view. Because a lot of the caves I noticed going in uh, can be extremely dim uh, in some, some locations. So uh, yeah, you could certainly try to make it a bit more experiential and qualitative as opposed to didactic. And that would be, uh, yeah, really it's, it wouldn't be uh, tough to do. It would require a bit of artistic interpretation, but the data that we have contains the full range uh, of all that. Um, and then, yeah, the one source that we put in, I know it's a bit flashlight-like, but that could be an oil lamp as well. Um, so yeah, the software being what it is today, there's big strides in real-time rendering. And uh, so yeah, all the everything you were uh, describing uh, can certainly be accomplished. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Anne. Uh, we have a question. Were there any women traveling any part of the Silk Road? Well, the documentation that I had does not mention women traveling on the Silk Road. Although we know having such a large Jewish population that multiplied year by year in, in Kaifeng and other cities along the way, Obviously, they were women. If sometimes they travel with the with the, with the husbands uh, along the roads uh, for trade, most likely. But taking in consideration that those trips uh, took years and years for some traders, therefore the likelihood that women would travel from today's Israel or Persia all the way to China for four, five, six years and then come back, I, I don't see it. But maybe for one one-way trip that they would end up in Kaifeng and settling it in Kaifeng, very possible. That's, well, that's with, not the research. And when it comes to the, uh, the documents, Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati and their special collections, they have uh, numerous of these Kaifeng documents. But uh, let me share my screen real quick to show you one of these. 
So you see here another one of those memorial books that has uh, Chinese and Hebrew. But uh, for anyone who reads Hebrew, this is the word bot. Bot. So this is so and so daughter of so and so. And it's actually naming uh, uh, women in this memorial book. So it's, uh, it's one that I found very fascinating that here we have in Kaifeng, a memorial book for men of the synagogue and a memorial book for the women of the synagogue uh, in ways that I think needs to be explored even more is, um, uh, is that particularly uh, in Judaism, uh, was there intermarriage and was then their bilingual or, or did these travel as families? So I think, it's, I think the question is fantastic and it's something that needs to be explored even more. Yeah, exactly. of course, there are lots of intermarriages uh, because eventually uh, the, the, kind of the, the Kaifeng Jews, uh, they're only Chinese Jews, not Persian Jews that married Persian Jews and married Persian Jews, let's say, uh, for generations and generations. Uh, on top of it, I was looking for burial sites and I couldn't find any. Uh, that would have given us an indication of men, women buried, whatever, in between Dunhuang and, and Kaifeng. So that's that's another research to look for more for Jewish for graves, if possible. We have a lot more questions about um, the community in Kaifeng. So I'll read them all because they're all related. One is: Are there Jews anymore in Kaifeng? When would they have left? If not, and where did they go? Another question is, um, what is the status of the Jewish community in Kaifeng? And someone asked, when and how did Jewish settlement in Kaifeng die out? Well, according to, to my research, well, today there are no, well, there are few people that they claim to be Jews in Kaifeng today, but the uh, majority of the Jews left Kaifeng in the 14, 1500s as the Chinese capitals move from place to place, the Jews kind of follow the capital city and establish business there. Um, most of the Jews that left Kaifeng went towards Shanghai, Beijing, as, as Marco Polo mentions, the Jewish merchants in Beijing in the 1300, but mostly went towards uh, Shanghai and Guangzhou, to my knowledge. There was a, a as I was asking myself those same questions, I had, there was an article I came across that said there are maybe a few hundred uh, left in uh, Kaifeng, but um, uh, most of them left definitely by the 19th century. But uh, the documents that are at Hebrew Union College, and in other private libraries, uh, they were bought in the mid 1800s by a uh, British kind of missionary society. So in the middle 1800s, these were bought, taken back to England, and then now they're in private collections in various places. Yeah, there were still Jews in the 17th, 18th century uh, that they were practically begging their brothers in, in Shanghai that they were by far wealthier uh, to support them. And they were selling their books to the Jewish community in, in Shanghai. Uh, that, and that continued you know, till the 18th, 19th century. But today, there are few families that they claim to be, to be Jews in Kaifeng. I didn't meet them. Next time I'm in Kaifeng, I'll certainly look for them. There were some images when I worked at the Getty Research Institute of um, the Jewish community in Kaifeng taken in uh, the 19th century. So very late 1800s, very early, early 20th century, early 1900s as well. But ethnically they appeared to be Chinese. Um, they just had certain manners of dress and uh, other objects but other, that would identify them um, as in terms of their religious affiliation. But other than that, and it was marked at the bottom of this um, series of images, it's in the Getty Research Institute's collection. They're, yes, also, identified, they're also identified by name mm -hmm. because the, the Jewish Chinese names refer to like to Ashkenazi names, if it's right. called in, in our, 
you know, naming would be the translation Li in Chinese that is gold. So there are like four or five names that were specific for the Jews back then. Uh, how it translated till today, I do not know. We have a comment from uh, Nancy Berliner. She mentioned, I believe they're Tang Dynasty Jewish graves in Fujian province as well. So um, further south and along the coast. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we have a question here. Do we speculate that travelers on the Silk Road stayed in groups for protection, i.e. caravans? If so, do we speculate the groups were ethnically and religiously mixed or did co-religionists stick only to each other? Originally, if they would come from Middle East, was a cohesive caravan that was formed there. That's not to say that along the road, while reaching the Gobi Desert or, you know, Dunhuang, China, they did not continue with other caravans just for that specific purpose of, of protection. Uh, there's no animosity that, that we've seen among uh, merchants. At times, of course, they were, but even as today or, or 19th century or early 20th century, well, these caravans are for protection. So people were attaching themselves to those caravans. So yeah, at some point, I'm quite sure they were mixed. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have a question about the caves. What was their purpose? So what was the purpose of the Dunhuang Caves? The caves were built in the, in the beginning, in the very beginning, by the Buddhist monks just as a prayer place. As the town became wealthy, then the wealthy people were dedicating caves to relatives, to Buddha, and they were paying the monks to uh, carve these caves and paint them and uh, be just a memorial to somebody. Uh, the emperors of China uh, dedicated caves. So they served a, a, a dual purpose uh, from the beginning until the time they were closed in the 11th century as prayer and as dedication to somebody. And there are some caves we don't know the purpose of. It. There's not, it's not well documented. So we have you know, particular ideas about the use of the caves based on the paintings and based on their position in the complex and others we're not so sure of. Yeah, because you have the Northern caves that they are very poorly decorated or not decorated at all. And you have them by the hundreds. Therefore, you would assume that monk A just carved it there and sat in that cave for whatever period of time, just for prayers. No, no, no other purpose. Right. Well, or that was so richly decorated and costed so much money to uh, to paint them and for the sculptures, you would assume that somebody had to pay for it. And also Mimi's mentioned the, um, you, some people would create caves in order to gain merit in the afterlife. So this idea of Buddhist belief. So you've decorated this cave and you hope to gain merit for yourself and for your family. Thank you, Mimi. Very true. Um, we have a question. Was there any type of organization in the storage of the scrolls and manuscripts that were found or were they just stacked up as shown in Eric's picture? Well, the caves were closed in the 11th century in order to, to protect it from impending war. Uh, if they were stacked up, organized by category, well, I do not know. They were, I, I believe they were just stacked up in order to jam in there as much as possible because when you talk about a cave that is so small to have 50,000 manuscripts and, and, and paintings and sculptures and God knows what else, well, nobody sat to organize it, I guess. Everything was done in a rush, thrown in there, they sealed the cave and left. And, and we don't know why. There's no, we, we're not absolutely certain as to why know, the library cave was We know why they closed it, but we don't know if it was any specific organizational system for the scrolls or for the, uh, or for the sculptures. But from the pictures that we see, it's just piles and piles. And 
unlike mod, like if today we were to stumble upon a cave like that, we would be very methodical in how we're taking items out, how we're cataloging it, what order. But it doesn't seem like Stein and Paleo had the same, and again, they were 120 some years ago, uh, right. the same organizational structure. Because it would have been nice to know did everything in this area, was it all Buddhist? And then here were, here's the one Hebrew over here and all of that. So uh, I think that's something that we may just never know the exact reality. Right, because scrolls from the very beginning began to be removed. From yeah, the the library library would is that, uh, when that monk discovered the, the, the cave in 1900, went inside, so all these, all these scrolls, maybe himself started to go through them to see what they are. And when Stein and uh, and Peliot came, they were just going through them like a, a kid in the candy store, just to find yeah. what they want to take back to their home country. So I don't think they were thinking of cataloging anything. So that's that's very hard to to figure out how it was left originally. All right, we have time for maybe one more question. And that would be, so we can't necessarily discount typical facial features and native dress depicted in the tomb figures of the Ming Qi of the Tang Dynasty figures of foreigners as proof or at least suggestive of actual persons on the Silk Road. According to Ezekiel Schloss in his ancient Chinese ceramic sculpture from Han through Tang, he identifies Turkic grooms, Cotonese, Persian, and Jewish or Semitic merchants with specific reference to facial features and native dress. Do you feel these very numerous figures, so that like the sculptures, document various ethnic groups, and in particular, that Jewish groups were indeed present? I am not quite sure that I, I, I get the the entire question. But, it's a long question. Uh, I think it's uh, asking about the tomb sculptures that you showed at the very beginning of your those, presentation, well, Vladi. Those sculptures are the, in the Liuang Museum. I never seen them with my own eyes. Uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, how they were identified uh, and cataloged. That's on the museums, you know, they, they put it as Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, merchant and, and, and Jewish confectionery. But now I was talking to us, I was talking to Eric some time ago uh, to have uh, facial recognition of, uh, of, of different faces. Uh, so let's say we take uh, this Jewish sculpture, this Jewish uh, merchant, and we have in the Mogao caves, uh, many scenes of, uh, of foreign merchants. And if we can kind of match faces, eventually maybe we'll find something that we didn't see before. There are many merchants, you know, depicted on those, on those caves. But I didn't have that ability up to now to, uh, to have facial recognition. And, and maybe we come with, uh, with Eric to some technological advances with the, with the VR that we can have facial recognition. Wonderful, thank you all so much. And I'd like to say there are some people whose questions we did not get to. If you ha ha still have your email where you registered, please hit reply and send your questions to us and we'll be happy to forward them on to our panelists. So I apologize in advance if we did not get to your questions. So Vladi, Bobby and Eric, Thank you all so much for being with here tonight and for shedding light on the history of Jewish merchants on the Silk Road. Um, it was fascinating to learn more about the Jewish community in Kaifeng. Uh, recent developments in the translation of Dunhuang's Hebrew and Syriac documents. And also to see the VR demonstration of the library cave as it may have appeared at the time of its discovery. We can't thank you each enough. Um, as a note, our next lecture will be on April 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. That's Thursday, April 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Our speaker will be Dr. Yuping Lok, 
who is the Basil Gray Curator of Chinese Paintings, Prints, and Central Asian Collections at the British Museum in London. Dr. Luck will be speaking on the Oral Stein Collection at the British Museum, and in particular on material from the library cave, so it ties in quite closely with tonight's lecture. Further information on this lecture is forthcoming. Um, to our viewers, sincere thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we greatly appreciate you and your encouragement. I'd like to thank our speakers once more and to wish everyone a very pleasant evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you.